you'll join us there. It is so good to have Dawson McAllister with us. We've been praying for him. He and his brother Jake, they're visiting for uh, till July 9th. And we're just uh, so happy that he is doing well and glad they can spend time with the grandparents. And um, so welcome to Virginia. Thank you guys for bringing all that hot weather with you from Florida. <laughs> but uh, seriously, it's great to have them with us today. We're going to begin our study here in Joel. We'll begin in Joel chapter 1, verse 1, just a moment. You know, I was thinking this past week, uh, this month marks uh, 33 years that I've been pastor here. And I know you're thinking, well, I can't believe he began when he was seven years old. But, <laughs> but uh, seriously, thank you for putting up with me for that long. And uh, Thank my wife, Karen, for standing with me and being alongside of me in ministry throughout this time. Uh, but I was doing some figuring this past week, and these 33 years, if I figure an average, you know, we have homecoming where I don't preach, usually two or three weeks off, uh, average of about 48 weeks uh, out of the year over these years that I preached. I preached somewhere just shy of 1,600 messages from this pulpit just on Sunday morning. That's not including funerals and things like that. Um, and I can honestly say God is my witness and God's blessed me in these 33 years. I've never used leftovers. I've never preached the same message twice here. I will confess there have been messages God has given me here that maybe I've used in revival somewhere else. But on Sunday morning, I may have preached from the same text, but never uh, the same message. I try to pre preach uniquely in a particular setting uh, of time. I preached in that time from Genesis to Revelation. I think we've been through on midweek at least three studies in Revelation in this time, full studies, um, uh, either on Sunday nights or, or Wednesday nights. I preach from narrative portions, didactic portions of Scripture, uh, both. Um, and uh, preach from a number of different books, even Song of Solomon. I think I preached once from Song of Solomon. I know I did a midweek study on Song of Solomon, uh, but it's very interesting of all, the almost 1600 Sunday morning messages that I have preached. I only recall preaching from the book of Joel one time. And that's amazing when you figure 1600 and Joel's a, a significant book in the Bible. I don't know if there's any reason for it. I, I will tell you this, it, contextually, it, is, it may arguably be the most difficult book to say exactly when um, it was uh, uh, presented. But we're going to start a journey today and for the next four or five weeks we'll be in the book of Joel. And I want to begin reading in Joel chapter 1. Verse 1 today, the word of the Lord came to Joel, son of Bethuel. Hear this, you elders, listen, all you inhabitants of the land. Has anything like this ever happened in your days or in the days of your ancestors? Tell your children about it. Let your children tell their children and their children, the next generation, what the devouring locust has left, the swarming locust has eaten, what the swarming locust has left, the young locust has eaten, and what the young locust has left, the destroying locust has eaten. Wake up, you drunkards, and weep. Wail, all you wine drinkers, because of the sweet wine, for it has been taken from your mouth. For a nation has invaded my land, powerful and without number. Its teeth are the teeth of a lion, and it has the fangs of a lioness. It has devastated my grapevine and splintered my fig tree. It has stripped off its bark and thrown it away. Its branches have turned white. And that, that is, all the bark has been torn off. Grieve like a young woman dressed in sackcloth, mourning for the husband of her youth. Grain and drink offerings have been cut off from the house of the Lord. The priests who are ministers of the Lord mourn. The fields are destroyed. The land grieves. Indeed, the grain is destroyed. The new wine is dried up and the fresh oil fails. Be ashamed, you farmers. Well, you vine dressers over the wheat and the barley, because the harvest of the field has perished. The grapevine is dried up and the fig tree is withered. The pomegranate, the date palm and the apple, all the trees of the orchard have withered. Indeed, human joy has dried up. Dress in sackcloth and lament, you priests. Well, you ministers of the altar, come and spend 
the night in sackcloth, you ministers of my God, because grain offerings and drink offerings are withheld from the house of your God. Announce a sacred feast, proclaim a so uh, fast, rather, proclaim a solemn assembly, gather the elders and all the residents of the land at the house of the Lord your God, and cry out to the Lord, woe because of that day, for the day of the Lord is near and will come as devastation from the Almighty. Hasn't the food been cut off before our eyes? Joy and gladness from the house of our God. The seeds lie shriveled in their casings. The storehouses are ruined and the granaries are broken down because the grain has withered away. How the animals groan, the herds of cattle wander in confusion since they have no pasture. Pasture, Even the flocks of sheep and goats suffer punishment. I call to you, Lord, for fire has consumed the pastures of the wilderness, and the flames have devoured all the trees of the orchard. Even the wild animals cry out to you, for the riverbeds are dried up, and fire has consumed the pastures of the wilderness. Let's pray. Father, as we look to your word today, um, you have the words of life. God, you're sovereign over all of this earth. And Father, you're worthy of our worship. And so, Lord, as we open your word today, open our hearts that we might apply our, our hearts to the truth of your word. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Boy, that was almost uh, uh, depressing to read, wasn't it, as you go through these 20 verses and see what is described here in Joel uh, chapter 1. You know, Joel is uh, one of uh, 12 minor prophets in the listing of the minor prophets in order. He's the second of the 12. And when we use the term minor prophet, it has nothing to do with the relevance of his message. It has more to do with the content of his message. In other words, there are 12 minor prophets, and as compared to Jeremiah and Isaiah that have around 52 and 66 chapters each, uh, these minor prophets are much more brief in their content, but nonetheless are relevant. In the case of Joel, uh, there are three chapters in Joel, and we know very little about the prophet Joel. In fact, what we see about him uh, background-wise, we find in really the first verse, and there's very little said other than the name of his father. His father was named Pethuel. We know nothing much about Joel. His father, Pethuel, was not a, a, a notorious person in the Bible. We know that Pethuel, his father's name, is a spiritual name. It is persuaded of God. So we might assume that Joel himself was raised in a God-fearing home. The name Joel means Yahweh or the Lord is God. But other than that, we know very little about him. We know very little about the date of his prophecy. For instance, when you open up uh, Zephaniah and you begin to read there in the very first verse or two, you can tell that he wrote, it says, in the days of King Josiah, one of the kings of Judah. Uh, when you open Zechariah, which has about 14 chapters and is, I believe, the penultimate, the second to last book uh, in the Old Testament, um, and you read that, you understand that he wrote during the time of uh, the, the Darius the Mede, the Medo-Persian king. And so we can read these and we can understand exactly when uh, these other prophecies were given. But all we see in Joel chapter 1 and verse 1, the word of the Lord that came to Joel, son of Pethuel, doesn't give us any particular context. And, and there are a number of theories um, and a number of good theories. Paul uh, and I have talked about those this week. Um, I think one thing that we can know is that it definitely was given as a prophecy before uh, the fall of Jerusalem in the hands of the Babylonians and the destruction of the temple. You say, how do we know that? Because we see even listed in our chapter here, the priests and the lack of offerings, and they would be given uh, in that particular context. But other than knowing that, while there are some, some good opinions, uh, we see that a lot of scholars really vary in um, their understanding of when this book was written. You know, now there's some portions of the Bible it's important 
that we know the context. Others, maybe not so much. A few weeks ago, uh, we were looking at Paul's missionary journeys. And you remember toward the end of it, uh, Paul was collecting an offering uh, from the Macedonian and the Achaean churches. And he was taking that offering, you may remember, to the Jews, the Jewish Christians that were in Jerusalem. And it's very important that we understand the context of that, what was happening, when was happening. And it was this, that it was very important that these Gentiles who were new believers reach out in grace and in love to Jewish Christians because those those Jewish Christians were under pressure from Orthodox Jews and devout Jews that were not Messianic Jews. And so it was a witness to the yet to be or unbelieving Jews. And it was a, a sort of a, a gift of solidarity for Christians. And so it's important that we know when Paul was challenging them, the context of that. But there are other portions of scripture that we can really apply even if we don't know exactly when it was written, even if we don't know the context of that. And such is the case um, with uh, the book of Joel. There was a commentator named Wayne Garrett, and he brought out this point that we can still get a message from this, even though we don't understand the exact context. And I quote him, he said, clear pointers to the date of Joel are few and far between. Any suggested time frame for the book should be tentative. In other words, not written in, in ink, but written in pencil. And the interpretation of the book should not depend upon any hypothetical historical situation. In other words, we shouldn't feel the pressure to say, well, I know he wrote this time, and this is why, because we just don't know for sure. But it's included in the scripture, and even though we may not know when it is written, it's important. And there's a common theme in the book, the day of the Lord. We're just going to briefly look at the day of the Lord today before we close our study. And we're going to study it more in depth in the weeks that lie ahead. But I want to begin here in Joel 1. And what we see here is a natural disaster, that God sends a natural disaster that shakes not the unbelievers, but it shakes the people of God. It devastates the people, devastates the economy, devastates the land, devastates all of known creation in that part of the world. And, and as we look at that, I, I want to also look at this concept of day of the Lord that we're going to be building upon. But today I want to note three things that we can glean, we can gather from our study here in Joel chapter 1. And the first is this, our God is sovereign over all things. He is sovereign over all. He controls everything. He makes the sun rise in the morning. He causes it to set at night. He brings the heat even when we may know it. He brings the rain when we need it. He brings the snow. He is in control of all things. Last week, you may remember, we studied in Jeremiah chapter 27, and God said something about himself through that prophet Jeremiah, and we found it in verse 5 of Jeremiah. 27. He said, with my great power, this is God speaking, and my outstretched arm, I made the earth and its people and the animals that are on it, and I give it to anyone I please. Now, we know the context of that. It was right during the time of uh, the Babylonian invasion of um, the southern kingdom of Judah. And we do know that God is saying that I have control of all things and I move the peace of this chessboard. He says, I do with people what I want, no matter if this person is a pagan person, an unbelieving person, if this person's a believer, or whatever the case, I move the pieces of this. And we see that the piece that he was going to move was Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar was not God-fearing. He was a very arrogant, a very proud man, but God used him. And he brought in the Babylonian army as an instrument to bring judgment judgment on the nation of Judah. And so we see that he worked through a king and he worked through an army. But here in Joel chapter 1, we see that he works through an army of a different kind. He works through an infestation that brings devastation, an infestation that brings devastation. He worked through an army of locusts. Now, a lot of people may say, well, this is figurative language. It's speaking of a literal army that's coming. I don't see 
I don't see that myself in the study, and, and we'll look at our interpretation of this, but to me, as I've studied it, as I've studied other people who studied it, it makes it very clear to me what we see is a large, innumerable number of locusts, literal locusts, that would devastate the land of Israel. Now we see in verse 4 that this army of locusts had four divisions. There were the devouring locusts, the swarming locusts in verse 4, um, the young locusts, and then the destroying locusts. Four different groups that are mentioned. Some of these locusts, uh, they flew through the air. Some of them, they crawled on the ground. But it's very interesting uh, what one locust, one division of locusts did not destroy. The next one would pick right up until there was total devastation. Now, historically, again, we don't know when this happened. We know that it happened. And it, and it may be easy to say why we know it doesn't happen. Because this was a direct um, attack of the locusts on the land of Judah. It wasn't a worldwide. It was only mentioned in this one part. In being regional, uh, historians of that day may not have thought it to be important to put that in any type of historical record. Nonetheless, we know that it happened. And we see the effects that the locusts had. Um, Paul and I, uh, Paul Singer and I have been talking this week about it. It's very interesting. He shared with me about uh, what he had read this past week about how devastating uh, a locust invasion can be. In 1874, in sort of the middle part of the United States, the Great Plains, the U.S., and into Canada, amazingly, an army of locusts invaded that part of the known world, 1874. They covered two million square miles, these locusts, causing millions of dollars in damage. The swarm was so thick, it was documented that they could block the light of the sun for up to six hours in a day. They consumed crops, trees, leaves, grass. Get this, these locusts in 1874 consumed wool from the sheep. And not even that, even harnesses for horses and wooden pitchfork handles, they devastated. The land behind them was left as if it had been scorched by fire. So we see here in Joel chapter 1, years before that, God is speaking of an army with a similar destruction. Again, what one division of the locusts would leave, the second would come and do further destruction. What that would leave, the third group would come in, the third division and destroy, and then the fourth would come in. And so what we see through all of this is that God's hand was orchestrating all of that. It was his hand of judgment. You know, God answers to no one. He does as he wills. By the very grace of God, he allowed you to awaken this morning. He gave you the grace. By God's grace, he has kept you free to this point, maybe from cancer or from some other debilitating situation. By God's grace, maybe God allowed doctors to find a disease and catch it early enough to be able to bring healing. But God is sovereign over all things. He uses whom and what he desires. He does it to send big messages to nations, as we see here, and he is sovereign over creation to use it even to speak to individuals. One of the greatest illustrations of this is found in Jonah chapter 4. We've looked at it before. God uses creation. So many times we think God sent earlier in the book of Jonah the great fish, the great fish to swallow Jonah. But do you realize and that isn't all of nature that God used? But in Jonah chapter 4, he used a plant or a gourd. He used a tiny worm. He used the west wind that he controlled, the sun that he created to show Jonah how much he, God, loved the people of Nineveh. God used a nation we saw last week to bring judgment to the southern kingdom of Judah, God's people. And today we see that he uses insects. God is sovereign over all. What does that mean? You and I need to get in line with him. Notice what it says here in verse 14. Announce a sacred fast. He's speaking to the spiritual leaders. In other words, 
uh, a time of mourning, a time of withdrawing uh, from food. Proclaim a solemn assembly. In other words, he's calling uh, the people of God, the leaders of the people, to pray. We pray to a sovereign God. We're getting ready to send, I believe it's around seven children and, and four counselors will, are going with them this week. Some of these young people, they need to accept the Lord. They have never trusted Jesus Christ. Guess what? God is already knocking on their hearts. And we as the church, um, we have counselors that are going to be talking to these children about God, but we need to be talking to God about the children. We need to be praying, God, save these young people. Help them to see who Jesus Christ is. Guess what? God is so sovereign that he can bring in a swarm of locusts and devastate a land. He is so sovereign that he can overwhelm the heart of a young people with the love of Jesus Christ, that they would believe in him. Our God is sovereign. And he can do it. Well, I want you to see a second thing. Let's see how God acts. He sends a devastating judgment on his people. It's very interesting. No specific sin is listed here on behalf of the people. Now, there can be the argument in verse 5. He addresses the drunkards, and that is a sin. It is a sin to excessively indulge in alcohol, all right, to the point of inebriation. Okay, but, but really, even with that, I don't think he's so much talking about that particular sin as he was talking of people who were dependent upon the vine, and the vine was getting ready uh, to dry up. But we do know this, God is sending a judgment, and the judgment is coming uh, through these particular insects, and I want you to see a couple of things regarding the judgment. First, it was an exhaustive judgment. We've already seen it. What one division uh, did not destroy, the next division would come in and destroy. And, and, and we see described in verse 6, it is a nation. Now, I believe nation there is figuratively you. It's speaking about the locust because we see the result powerful and without number. Its teeth are the teeth of a lion, the fangs of a lioness. As we just saw how destructive they can even take the wooden handles off of something, this army. And they made prey what? Not of the people. They made prey of the land. But there was a domino effect that affected the people. It says that it devastated the vine and splintered the fig tree in verse 7. And then in verse 10, it says the fields are destroyed. The land grieves. Indeed, the grain is destroyed. The new wine is dried up. All the fresh oil fails. In other words, it was just like was described to us in Sherman's march uh, through Georgia, that the land before may have been rich and afterward, it was devastated. It was scorched. It was destroyed. Fire is the picture of judgment we see later in this, but it's the destruction that this army of locusts brought. But it was not only an exhaustive judgment. It was an economic judgment. You know, we're so blessed. We have the opportunity to go to grocery stores. But we forget sometimes in the Bible, in this agricultural economy, uh, there, wasn't, there were not grocery stores. And, and, and that day, you ate directly off the land. The agriculture controlled the whole economy directly. Now, even in our economy, it affects it, believe it or not. But directly, you can see that. And so we see there was this domino effect. The land was devastated by the locusts, and then that directly affected the economy. And that was the second uh, effect, the economy on the people. And it's not difficult for us to understand it, but I want you to see the groups that were affected. First, the consumers were affected by this. Verse 5, wake up, you drunkards, and weep. Well, all you wine drinkers, because of the sweet wine, for it has been taken from your mouth. Now, was it literally just, was it grabbed out of their hands? No. What had happened? The vine was drying up, and those who enjoyed 
consuming the fruit of the vine, they were to wail because it was being stripped from them. It also, we see it affected the producers. Look at verse 11. Be ashamed, you farmers. Well, you vine dressers over the wheat and the barley because the harvest of the field has perished. You know, we need rain now. We look out. I mean, when we walk out on the grass today, it's going to feel like potato chips crackling under us. But could you imagine this devastation more than just a couple of weeks without rain, but a total devastation and the source uh, for a livelihood from the farmers was taken from them. So we see the consumers, those that were partaking, the, the producers, the farmers. Then look at God's servants in, in verse 9. Eventually it trickled to the house of God, grain and drink offerings have been cut off from the house of the Lord. The priests who are ministers of the Lord mourn. Why were the priests mourning? Uh, they were to take the offerings that were brought from the people into the temple area, but they weren't there. There were no more drink offerings because the vine had withered. The animals were shriveling up. There was no, there was no vegetation. And so it affected even the house of God. It affected the young and the hopeful. Look at verse 8. Grieve like a young woman dressed in sackcloth mourning for the husband of a youth. What a grieving thing. Uh, a young woman anticipating, engaged to be married to the young man and then the young man be taken away in death. And in a way, it was like the land experienced death and those who were to enjoy the land, the young and old alike were devastated. The old and experienced, verse 2, hear this, you elders, listen, you inhabitants of the Lord of the land. Has anything like this ever happened in your days? In other words, he was talking to the old people and he was saying, you've lived a lot of life, but what you're seeing here in these days has exceeded all of it. So we see the devastation affected the economy. It affected the old. It affected the young. It affected the producers, the consumers. It even affected uh, the believers, the, those that were carrying out the ministry of the church. God sent it, and it devastated the economy. You know, we're in the midst of campaign season. One thing that makes me either laugh or cry is when a man will take credit for the economy. Bidenomics, MAGA economy, and they're up there like, we are the real deal. We have all of the answers. And I'm thinking, man, God can shake it in one second. In one second. Make no mistake about it. There is not a political figure who controls the economy. It's God. And God is looking at our nation. And he's looking at our nation and we're calling what's right, wrong, and what's wrong, right. And we're supporting the annihilation of babies in the wombs. And we're supporting uh, lifestyles that are unacceptable and an abomination of the Lord, trying to fear various groups. And we're saying, God bless us, bless our economy. Man doesn't control the economy. You cannot read the Bible without understanding God controls the economy. One of the greatest illustrations of this was found in 2 Kings chapter 7 in Samaria. And the setting was this. There was a great famine over all of Samaria. A donkey's head. Now, I don't know. I haven't eaten a donkey's head before. It's not a delicacy. All right. But it said in that day in 2 Kings 7, you can read it, that the donkey's head sold for a prime amount of money. In other words, people were starving so much, the economy was so bad, they would pay a mint to eat a donkey's head. Not only that, dove's dung as food brought a prime amount of money. In other words, they were in a famine. It was a devastating time. And Elisha, not Elijah, Elisha the prophet came on the scene. And he said, it's going to change in one day. And he said this, six quarts of fine flour, which you couldn't have found anywhere before he preached that, will sell for just half an ounce. It's nothing. There'll be such an abundance it, you can give pennies and you can buy a lot. There's going to be so much. The law of supply and demand, there's going to be so much supply, it'll only cost pennies. And the king's servant looked at Elisha and said, if God opened up the heavens, it wouldn't happen. Elisha said, you'll see it but because you believe you won't ever enjoy a bit of it. And it happened. 
just like he said. And it happened in a way that only God could orchestrate. There were four men who had a skin disease. They were like lepers. They weren't part of uh, the, the uh, people group. They, weren't, they were outsiders. And they said, look, we're starving. These people who've rejected us, they don't have anything. Let's just go over to the Arameans and see if we can get some food. I mean, we're already dying. Let's just see if the Arameans will give us some food. And so they went in the camp. Guess what they found? The camp was empty of people. And there was an abundance of food that could have fed all of the people of Judah for I don't know how many days, how many, maybe months. And so they went and they enjoyed all they had. And they said, we're going to tell. And the people of, of, of Judah, uh, the people of Samaria said, look, it's a trap. They trapped us. They're going to try to lure us in. They know we're hungry. But then they got so desperate, they went in, they ate, and then six quarts of fine flour sold for a half an ounce. That's a sovereign God. He can bring it any way he wants, but make no mistake, he controls it. He controls it. So as we close the study this morning, we're going to open a study of a concept we're going to be looking at over the next couple of weeks, and it's called the day of the Lord. Now, we're going to spend more time on it, but I want to look very quickly at at four things, and these will be very quick because we're going to be moving. We don't have the time today. We're going to look more at the day of the Lord uh, ahead, but there are a few things to note. The first, the day of the Lord is a day when there is no mistake that God acts directly in history. It is the day of the Lord. It is his day when he works directly in history. The second thing, especially in the Old Testament, when the day of the Lord is mentioned, it is often a day that is accompanied by judgment against sin. That God is acting. It's not some uh, indirect way. It is a direct action of God. And it is many times in the Old Testament was mentioned It is associated with judgment of the ungodly. Now, here's the third truth. It has both a past, a present, a future, and and an ultimate reference. You think of this. The day of the Lord in the Exodus was when? When God came down and he parted the Red Sea. That was the day of the Lord. It was unmistaken. It was a visitation from God. There was no other explanation than God parted it because once Israel crossed and then the Egyptians tried to go through, the water fell back over them. It is a present day. It can have a present implication. It did here in Joel chapter 1. This was a day of the visitation of God. He is the one who controlled, who acted, who brought the army of locusts. But also, it is a future day. Look at chapter 2 and verse 18. The Lord became jealous for his land after all of this judgment, and he spared his people. The Lord answered, I'm about to send you grain, new wine, and fresh oil. That is a direct act of God, a visitation of God. He had sent the judgment. Then we see that he was going to send healing. But then there's an ultimate, an ultimate day of the Lord. And that's what we often speak of. And that is the day when the Lord Jesus Christ comes back. Revelation 1, 7 says, every eye will see him. And now the Jehovah's Witness and knock on your door, they'll say he's already come and only the people who believe like they believe uh, saw that. No, because that's a total contradiction of scripture. Revelation 1, 7 says every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. There's coming a day when Jesus Christ is coming back. And we see here in Joel 1, a day of the visitation of God, which was a terrible day for those who had disobeyed God. But I want to tell you today, this ultimate day of the Lord when he comes back doesn't have to be a dread, a day of dread for you. A few years back, um, when our youngest son, John Mark, was still at home, he was the... uh, only son left at home that time. Um, He was probably a a senior in high school and Karen and I were gone. It may have been overnight or for most of the day. And we decided to leave John Mark on his own. Um, Probably a mistake. We came back that day. He didn't do anything terrible. He didn't rob anything. He didn't. But when we came back, um, we had an informant that said he left 
and left the door wide open. He was in Farmville for like eight hours or six hours or whatever, and left the door to the house wide open. So I knew that when we came back. Then we came back, and he and his good buddy Mal Malachi were hanging out. And I go into the kitchen, and the freezer door is left wide open. They had gotten freezy pops. They left the door. They, they threw the box away, but they left the door to the freezer wide open. We lost all of that stuff. And it was a terrible day of visitation when Karen and I got home. I wasn't too happy. I wasn't too happy. Listen, there's coming a day when the Lord's coming back. And it doesn't have to be a day of dread. You can be ready. You can be ready. Whenever God sends a message through his word, he is always accomplishing something. We saw that a couple of weeks ago when we were looking at Jeremiah. In fact, last week, God had been saying, I'm sending judgment, I'm going to send judgment, I'm going to send judgment. And then as an act of mercy, he said, I'm still going to send judgment, but I'm still, if you'll just obey me and just Give in. Just allow it to happen. I will still show mercy to you. God will show you mercy. But there's coming a day, a day of visitation, that ultimate day, when you won't have a chance. Why not trust Christ now? Why not say, God, I want to trust Jesus Christ. I'm tired of living a life of disobedience, a life of my own, a life doing what I want. I want to put you first in my life. Would you say that today? We're going to close our eyes right now. If you have never prayed this before and you mean it in your heart, you can silently lift this prayer to God. Lord, I know I am a sinner. I know that Jesus came and died for me. I know that he came to take the devastating judgment that should be pointed to me and he took it upon himself. If I would only believe and trust in him, I'll be saved from that devastating judgment. Lord, I know that Jesus is coming back. I repent of my sin. I place my faith in him. Come into my life and live forever through me. And I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. If you've never prayed that prayer before, and that was the prayer of your heart to God, why not make that public? Why not say, Lord, I'm not ashamed of you. I identify with you. I'm going to let people know that I'm going to follow God with all of my might, with all of my will, knowing that even when I fall short, that Jesus price that he paid on the cross covers me. We're going to give you an opportunity in just a moment to stand and sing our closing hymn. It's not just a closing hymn, but it's a hymn that gives us an opportunity to respond. Trust and obey. Trust and obey. There's no other.